Hi. Boy, we've got a nice hi, Gavin. How are you? Um, good to see everybody this morning. Okay. Glad everybody's here. And Pierce, I'm so glad to see you. Okay. You're doing all right, buddy? Okay. I've been praying for you. Okay. All right. Um, what our story is about today, and I'm sure all of you have heard about it. How many of you heard the story in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis? And it's all about Sarah and Abraham and their son Isaac. How many of you know that story? Okay, that's what I thought. And Miss Julie told me it's been a couple, three months ago that you had that in junior church, okay? So this is just more of the story, okay? A little bit more. And it kind of ties into what Pastor Tom's going to be teaching us a little bit later, okay? But anyway, Sarah, oh, that thing's loud. Okay, Sarah and Abraham, they had wanted for years and years and years to have a baby, and they couldn't have a baby. But you know what? Abraham was promised by God that, yes, they were going to have a child. But you know what? Sarah was 90 years old. 90 years old, and she finally had baby Isaac, okay? Well, baby Isaac came along, okay? And they were happy. God had stuck to his promise. He promised they would have a child, and they did. But you know what? After Isaac grew, and he was a young boy, okay? Probably a little bit older than some of you, okay? But guess what God did? God asked him, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, and I want you to take him up, and I want you to sacrifice him. <gasps> Abraham thought, oh, my goodness, we waited all these years for a miracle. And God did. He gave us his son Isaac. But you know what happened? Because Abraham was so sad. But you know what? He was sad, yes. And he loved Isaac so very, very much. But you know what? He loved God even more. So he wanted to obey God. And so he took Isaac, and they were going to sacrifice him. But you know what happened? Right before, right before he was going to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, God provided a sheep, and the sheep, Isaac and his daddy Abraham, they put that on the altar, and then they praised and they worshiped God. And then they got to go home, and then God, because Abraham was so faithful, he was so very faithful to God, God said, I'm keeping my promise to you because you were so faithful. You're going to have all kinds of grandkids and great-grandkids and great-great-great-grandkids, and you're going to be so happy. And you know what? It is so important for us. Sometimes we don't understand why God does what God does, okay? Abraham certainly didn't understand why God made him take Isaac and become a sacrifice because it didn't make sense, did it? Sometimes God asks us to do things that really doesn't make sense. But it's very important that we all know what God wants. And how do you think that we know what God wants? Does anybody have a good idea? How do we know what God wants? Kyrie? What should we do? It's okay. Yes. Pray. There's another way. What can we do? He wants us to be kind to others. Yes, sir. Absolutely. That's it. That's how we're going to know what God wants us to do is by reading the Bible. Okay? Some of us aren't old enough to read a whole lot. But the older we get, the more we're going to learn to read. And it's very important that we read the Bible for ourselves. Go to Sunday school, read the Bible, and pray. Those are how it's so very, very important, okay? All right, let's bow our heads. Dearly Father, thank you so very much for these wonderful, wonderful children. Uh, we come to you, and we just ask you to help us to do all the things that you would have us to do. Guide us and direct us to do what we need to do reading the Bible and praying, and we just know that you're with us, and we know that you keep your promises. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.
Now, I want to commend Glenn. That boy was bringing the heat up here with your dancing moves, brother. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I, it was Saturday night fever all over again, man. <laughs> bringing those moves. <laughs> it's easy for the guy to say that who is down there, right? Yeah, I know. For my... <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Glenn's bigger than me. He can take me probably. So, <laughs> From our own limited perspective, because that's what you and I have. We have limited perspectives. There are occasions when God calls us to do something that, quite frankly, doesn't make sense. It might involve anything from personal relationships to initiating difficult conversations. Maybe it's the challenge to take on an additional responsibility, you know, because I've been sharing for a while about we have a need for a few people to step up to the plate and and help with uh, teaching children's church. And so it might be the challenge to take on an additional responsibility. It might be the challenge to release a responsibility, one that we hold near and dear. It might even surround the need for a total career change or at least a reshaping of our goals and objectives. Now, for many of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, For some of you, you would say, well, I really haven't experienced that to this point, and I would share, but you will. And when it does happen, how might we qualify our bewilderment? Because that's what happens to us when God doesn't seem to make sense, or when he puts us in situations that don't make sense, and we say, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing. We are bewildered, and so we try to justify how it is that we feel. Shall we base it on the fact that we're comfortable in our present surroundings? Because that's an easy one. Okay, when God isn't making sense and he calls us to do something and he puts us in a situation, we say, but Lord, I'm comfortable in my present surroundings. It might have something to do with our financial position. Sometimes when God doesn't make sense, We recognize that, Lord, I don't understand what you're saying because don't you realize how how that's going to affect me financially? Maybe we'll say that God's plan doesn't make sense because we're simply not the type who likes to rock the boat. Now, Lord, that doesn't make sense because, after all, you made me and you know my personality. Well, regardless of any argument you and I might offer, Friends, we will know because we know that the Holy Spirit is showing us an open door. By going forward, though it's true that our lives may be upended, and guess what? Here's a whole book full of stories of lives being upended. Though that's true, I also have a whole book here that shares how our obedience might just lead to the amazing. If you would, stand with me, please. Let's turn to our text, Genesis chapter 22. Miss Sandy had an excellent message for the kids, and that's what I'm going to draw from. And perhaps this is where you are this morning. Maybe something's going on in your life, and it seems to you that God isn't making sense. Lord, I just don't understand. You know, I can remember when I was called to the ministry, I mean, My whole life was tracked out. I had tracked out my whole life. I knew what I was doing. And then everything got upended when I received Christ. I had no clue where my life would wind up. And you can find yourself in a position, I don't care what age you are. You could be retired and you think, man, I've already done it. I've seen it. I've said it. And I'm set in my ways right now. And then the Lord sweeps through and you had no idea. So I guarantee in a group this size... Someone, you think right now, oh man, the Lord's speaking right to me. I don't know who you are, what you're going through, but he does. He's got a message this morning for you. Genesis chapter 22, starting with verse 1. 
It reads, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, that's important. I'll talk about that in a little bit. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and, and said to his father Abraham, so it had been quiet. There had been a calmness, a quietness here. It was Isaac who spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, he tied him up, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Father, we come to you in prayer this morning. The only way that we can, and that is in the name of Jesus, the Christ, your son. It's the only way that we can approach the the throne. Now, we've got a world out there that just thinks that they could play God in the box and, and they can make a wish upon the God and, and all these different things. But we know, Father, that the only way that we can come to you is through your Son, Jesus. And this morning we do, Lord. We present ourselves to you. We are your people. And Lord, we admit and you know this, because we have such a limited perspective. We admit that to us you don't always make sense. Um, but Lord, you love us. And you're patient with us. And there are many times where I, it seems to me that you, perhaps you just kind of smile and, and you can lean back and say, oh, <laughs> just you watch. Lord, there's some here this morning, I'm sure, that they find themselves in some sort of quandary. And maybe not even necessarily bad, but just a, a position of change and, and wondering, what is it that God is doing with my life? I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. Well, Lord, we pray this morning that you would put them at ease, that you would calm them and let them know that everything's going to be okay. And Father, as we hear this young child, I, we would be remiss if we didn't thank you for these kids. Oh, seriously, how beautiful to hear that noise. How beautiful it is to you, Lord, as you hear the children and the special relationship that you have with them. Let the little children come unto me. Do not hinder them. So, Lord, we ask that you would speak to all of us this morning, from the youngest to the oldest. Draw us close. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the story of Abraham and Isaac has always been a go-to 
of how God may not always seem to make sense. In fact, this might be at least one of the top two or three stories, in, in my opinion, in all of Scripture, where it seems that God doesn't always make sense. Now, for those that are unfamiliar, Genesis 21 reads, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. This wasn't a bad thing. This was a good thing. God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. In fact, that's what Isaac means. He laughs. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah, that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Waiting until Abraham was a century old and his wife Sarah 90 years old, there would be no doubt of God's ability. I love when the Lord does that. When he does something that we cannot doubt, who did it? That could only be God. Friends, remember in all things, in all things, whatever's going on in your life today, if there is something in your life that it just seems that there's no way around and you fear the worst perhaps, in all things, God is able. Now with this birth, it was a joyous event. A joyous event and, and Abraham had an immediate an overwhelming love for his son. Isaac was everything to him. And many of you parents, you, you know this. Isaac to him was a gift from God. I mean, he and Sarah had gone so long. Oh, it's not possible. A gift. But then the Lord gave instructions that just didn't make sense. As shared in our text, when Isaac was a young man, and I think this is kind of important. Um, Isaac, most scholars say that, that, that when you crunch the numbers and you factor in a number of different things, most scholars believe that, that Isaac would have been between the age of 18 and 25. So Abraham loves this child. He's been with him for at least, probably at least 18 years. Lots of time to to grow close. I mean, he already had an immediate love, and, and how much deeper is that love now? But God told Abraham to sacrifice his beloved child as a burnt offering. That made no sense. Now, of course, right from the start, you and I, you and I know that this account, we're made privy to the fact that that this account, it was, it was only a test. That what Abraham was being asked to do, you and I are told that this was only a test. In short, God wanted to know just how far Abraham was willing to go. Did Abraham trust God enough? Listen, did Abraham trust God enough to obey regardless of the circumstances? I feel led to pose that question one more time. And you'll know if it applies to you. I don't. Do you trust God enough to obey regardless of the circumstances? Regardless of how it may not make sense from many different perspectives, perhaps. But friends, while you and I were told that this was a test, it's important that we recognize that for Abraham, any such information was hidden. Abraham had no idea that this was a test. Thus, we can only imagine his confusion, his fear, his heartache, and the inner struggle. I mean, think about it for a second. God had given him a gift. God, I was 100 years old. My wife, 90 years old. You gave us this child. This was a gift. This was your doing. I have had 18, 19, 20, 25 years of pouring into this child, of loving him, of training him in you. And now what you're asking me to do? 
And friends, by no means was there a quick resolution. There's not a spot there where the Lord calls Abraham to go and sacrifice his child. And, and Abraham, Abraham kind of looks up at him and then the Lord says, don't worry, I was just joshing. <laughs> don't do it. It didn't happen like that. There was no quick resolution. Instead, Abraham was made to feel every bit of God's command by way of prolonged preparation. Maybe you feel every bit of God's command this morning. You see, Abraham felt it. He felt the weight of it. He felt the confusion of it. He, can felt, he felt that this doesn't make sense. He felt it as, as he saddled the donkey. He felt it when he instructed the two servants and his son to join him. He felt it with each mile of the three-day journey. And when that mountain came into view, when it broke through the horizon, oh, he felt it. Most believe the location was Mount Moriah. And I would say you probably are familiar with it if you've ever seen a picture uh, of the Dome of the Rock, which was built 640 A.D., somewhere in there. And there's no doubt that Abraham became especially aware of the situation as he strapped wood to Isaac's back just prior to their final hike. I mean, think about it. God told him to do this. And it means what it says. And so there he is. He knows. He just had three days of feeling God's command. And now they're there. There it is on the horizon. And he's strapping the wood onto Isaac's back for Isaac to carry on with their hike. Abraham himself, he's got the fire. He has the knife. But here's the thing. At face value, though God wasn't making sense, in Abraham we find a silent confidence. With Abraham we find an abiding faith. Abiding meaning going forward no matter the case. In Abraham we find an abiding faith that God knew what he was doing. Abraham believed that God had a perfect plan and that God had perfect timing. Again, Genesis 22. Isaac spoke up. I believe it had been very quiet. Very quiet. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, and I believe that this would have been in hushed tones. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Friends, no matter how difficult or confusing your situation may look, trust God. God's ability to not only provide, but trust God's ability to do the amazing. It's a lot like a quote that I have recently shared with you by Francis Chan. It bears repeating. God doesn't call us to be comfortable. <laughs> Let me say it again. God does not call us to be comfortable. He calls us to trust him so completely. That means just overwhelmed with trust. To trust him so completely that we are unafraid to put ourselves in situations where we will be in trouble, where we will be in big trouble if he doesn't come through. Friends, this was Abraham. And it's often us. Case in point, serving as your pastor for nearly 18 years, in my estimation, in my estimation, it was nearly one year ago that Hartford City Wesleyan met her lowest point. 
foregoing the details, suffice it to say many of us were hurting. Many of us were perplexed. Yet by the Lord's directive, rather than give up, which would have been easy to do, and many in this world do just that thing, they give up. When we're in tight spots, there are folks that will give up, but not you. We chose to fight forward. Still, we may have questioned what God was up to. It didn't always make sense. Again, that was nearly 12 months ago, the lowest point. But then God provided. Today, I submit that we have arrived at one of our highest points. Being completely able, the Lord has increased our numbers, increased our finances. He has added two extraordinary ministry interns, top-notch individuals. He has healed fractured relationships. He has brought 11 people into covenant membership. And most important, four babies have been dedicated by their parents. Nine people have been baptized. And five souls have made their way to the altar to receive Christ. In the words of our district superintendent, Hartford City Wesleyan has had a tremendously successful turnaround. In fact, it was four days ago that Dr. Gorvet, our DS, he said, Tom, he said, I want you to know Hartford City Wesleyan is one of the healthiest churches in the entire district. <laughs> but to go even further, like never before, I mean this, what I'm about to say. Like never before, I believe that we will soon experience the largest growth spurt we have ever known. I mean, friends, I feel it's so heavy that it seems that I could reach out and just grab hold of it. It's that heavy. Growth that will impact this mission field in ways that you and I cannot yet imagine. Well, this is certainly good news and reason to celebrate. But again, it may seem that God doesn't always make sense. One more passage from Deuteronomy 34. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land. It was right there in front of him as though he could just reach out and grab hold of it. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I said I will give it to your descendants, I have let you see it with your eyes, but you, you will not cross over into it. Now understand on paper, if anyone, if anyone should have entered the promised land, that someone should have been Moses on paper. I mean, he led the people through thick and thin. He didn't give up. He helped establish a, a new generation of leaders. And though he had his moments of frustration, oh, he had his moments of frustration. Deuteronomy 34, 10 states, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And friends, that's a good thing. Still, God's plan, his vision for the future, is not always easily discernible. In the words of Jesus, do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You see, a lot of times when it seems that, oh, everything, what just happened? The Lord comes along and he says, it'll be okay. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Friends, in many regards, 
I feel like Moses. Though Hartford City Wesleyan is on the edge, right on the edge of something amazing, it's time for someone else to lead you across. With a very heavy heart, this morning I announce that I will be resigning no later than the end of June. So I'm still going to be with you for a while. In fact, I'll preach through Easter, and I'll still be here for a time after that. But by the end of June, there'll be someone new to lead you across. And though it may not seem to make sense, after much prayer, the Lord has prompted just not me, but has prompted my entire family to come alongside a, a congregation in Athens, Georgia. As such, the local board of administration will soon begin the process of a pastoral search. Friends, you have outstanding leaders. You have good, godly leaders. And the Lord already has someone in mind. This is not a bad thing. This is about the next new amazing chapter for Hartford City Wesleyan. Be assured, God's plans, they are amazing. Be assured, friends, that God in all things, God is able. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to provide you with hope and a future. Let's pray. Father, it doesn't always make sense. I mean, it's easy for, well, it's not easy. It's one thing for me to stand up here and, and preach my own situation or the situation with my family and to say, my goodness, this is all my kids have ever known. They're born and bred right here, just like a lot of folks that I've always been amazed with. Wife, well settled into her career at, at a notable hospital. Me, a pastor of a church that you have done the incredible with and done an incredible turnaround. And, and, and it is true that there's such growth just right there, right there. So things don't always make sense. And there are a lot of folks in this congregation that in their lives, Lord, they're going through something. And they say, Lord, what you're telling me to do or what you've, the situation you've placed me in, Lord, I don't understand. You don't seem to make sense to me right now. And it'll be okay. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for always being able. You are able. And you will do the amazing. You'll do the amazing here in Hartford City, Indiana. And you'll do the amazing down in Athens, Georgia. You'll do the amazing with my family. You'll do the amazing with every family represented in this congregation, you are able. We thank you and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. We're dismissed.